Okay, let's pick up where we left off with personality last time. And let's start with just a little bit of deep background, which is the shortest imaginable course in cognitive psychology and cognitive science. If you don't learn anything else, if you learn this, you've got the whole picture, okay? Uh, Jerome Bruner's three great aphorisms. First, the purpose of perception is action. The whole point of having a mind is to allow you to get along in the world. Uh, the whole idea behind studying the mind is that somehow the mind uh, enables us to engage in various kinds of adaptive behaviors to meet the challenges set by our environment to achieve the goals that we set for ourselves um, and so on. So the purpose of perception is action. No point in perceiving the environment unless you're going to do something about what you perceive. Second, Perception requires the perceiver to go beyond the information given in the stimulus. This is actually an insight that comes to us at least as long ago as the mid-19th century in Hermann von Helmholtz, but the general idea is that the stimulus is not sufficient to tell us what's going on in the world. The information provided by the stimulus is vague and fragmentary and ambiguous, and yet the perceiver has to supply something, has to supply knowledge, beliefs, expectations, something to fill in the gaps, to connect things up, and to form um, a uh, workable uh, mental representation of the world outside, so you can take the action that you need to take. And then finally, every act of perception entails an act of categorization. When we usually think about perception, we think about perception in terms of forming an internal mental representation of the physical features of a stimulus, what its shape is, uh, where it is in the environment, what it's doing, whether it's moving or stationary or whatever. But Bruner uh, embraced a more cognitive view of perception, which really uh, assumes that the act of perceiving is not complete until you've identified the object, until you know what it is. Um, and part of knowing what an object is, is knowing how that object is similar to other things you know about and different from other things you know about. And when you start classifying something as similar to one thing and different from others, you've categorized the object. And once you've categorized the object, that's a you, you've got a tremendous amount of information about the object because you can impute that that object has a number of features that kind of sort of go with objects in that category, even if you can't see them. You, you can kind of assume that they're there. So um, that's kind of what's, what, what's happening here. And it follows from this, though Bruner didn't say it himself, that action will differ if perception differs. And since categorization is, is, is an intimate part of perception, action will differ if categorization differs. If you categorize an event or an object in one way, you're going to behave towards that object in one way. If you categorize that object in some other way, slot it into some other category, you're going to behave very differently um, toward it. This insight, though he would never have admitted it, uh, lies at the heart of the most idiosyncratic, um, the most thoroughgoingly cognitive of all the approaches to personality and individual, and individual differences, which is the personal construct theory of George Kelly. George Kelly's there, spent his entire career at Ohio State University, was enormously influential. Uh, even though he didn't publish much, he wrote one book and a couple of articles. You could get tenure back then for that. Um, it's a book that hardly anybody has read all the way through. Um, uh, it's kind of like I don't know, Wittgenstein's Tractatus or something like that. Every philosopher owns it. Hardly anybody's read it. Um, and it's in large part unreadable. Um, Kelly was, uh, was an iconoclastic figure. Uh, he didn't interact with his colleagues very much. Um, uh, he had a very unique way of, uh, of viewing things. Uh, he used, uh, used words in very strange ways. Uh, basically not easy to penetrate. But what I'm going to do for the next... I don't know, 25 minutes is, tell you what's in a 1,500-page book that's almost unreadable, okay? Uh, because it's really an interesting cognitive approach to personality and begins with the insight 
that what's interesting about personality is that there are individual differences in behavior. That's how we observe. Uh, that, that's how we know the per, uh, that personality occurs. We see somebody being friendly and another person being unfriendly, and we say, oh, this one's friendly and this one's unfriendly. Those are individual differences in personality. Where do they come from? Well, if you're Bruner, if you're a cognitive psychologist or a cognitive scientist, you think that individual differences in behavior have their origins in individual differences in cognition. People, different people behave differently because they perceive the environment differently. Different people respond differently to a stimulus because they categorize that stimulus uh, the differently. And that's the essential insight that underlies Kelly's um, personal construct theory of personality. Kelly begins with a proposition which by now should be familiar to you. It's one that comes out of Piaget as well, though Kelly never cited Piaget. Um, uh, he didn't cite anybody except himself, um, which was the idea that people are naive scientists, that as we go around in the world, we're trying to figure out how the world works. We're trying to predict what's going to happen next, uh, given what we know, given what we're doing, or so on. And in the process of, the, of acquiring knowledge about the world, we do it kind of sort of the way scientists do it. We don't have all the tools and all the professional training that scientists are supposed to have, but we're still in the, um, uh, in the, uh, the, the, the scientific mode of inducing theories from experience, generating hypotheses based on our theories, testing those hypotheses, and revising our hypotheses and our theories based on the results of our little informal experiments. That's the idea behind the person as a naive scientist. And you'll remember that that comes to us from Lewin and Kelly uh, and others, as well as, uh, as well as from Piaget. Kelly argued that our hypotheses, the hypotheses that we generate and test as naive scientists, are based on what he called personal constructs. Kelly argued that all of us walk around in the world carrying around in our heads a set of constructs or categories or concepts that we use to, to guide our perception of the world and our action uh, in the world. Um, and I'll talk more about where these, what, what these personal constructs are like uh, in a minute. That's the whole point of this lecture. But that uh, he also ar argued that there was the possibility of what he called constructive alternativism. Not just that different people carried in their heads different sets of personal constructs that guided their perception and behavior, but that people themselves could shift from one construct to another. And when an individual shifted his mental view, his mental filter, if you will, from one construct to another, um, his perception of the world would change accordingly, and so would his or her behavior. So the idea is personal constructs are filters on our experience of the world. We have some flexibility in terms of the constructs that we use to filter our experience of the world, and which constructs we use are going to depend, are going to determine how we behave um, in um, uh, that world. The idiosyncrasy of Kelly's theory is, I think, nowhere better illustrated than by what he called the fundamental postulate of personal construct theory. A person's processes are psychologically channelized by the ways in which he anticipates events. This is a combination of words that is almost unique, I suppose, in English. Uh, he didn't want to talk about behavior. He didn't want to talk about thoughts. He wanted an umbrella term, so he chose the term processes psychologically channelized. That is, at the level, at the psychological level of analysis, that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about how neurons operate. He's not talking about how neurotransmitters work or genetic determinants of personality or anything else. He's talking about uh, uh, looking at behavior, thoughts, whatever, uh, at the psychological level of analysis. And then by the ways in which he anticipates events. That is, what you do, what you think, is going to be determined by what you expect to happen. Okay? And these expectations, it turns out, are going, to be, um, uh, are going to be generated by the constructs that you use to, uh, 
to, uh, to perceive the world. So what's missing from this? I mean, this is it. This is the whole theory. 1,500 pages later, you come back and you say, this is it. Uh, what's missing? There's no notion of personality traits. At this time, 1955, uh, personality psychology was divided into two, largely, uh, 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 two large camps. One, trait psychology, as exemplified by what we now call the Big Five theory of personality that said that you could locate people as points in some multidimensional space depending on how they measured up uh, in terms of various trait dispositions. Or psychoanalytic theory, which argued that personality really was determined by a set of primitive motives, uh, sexual and aggressive motives, and the defenses that were arrayed against them. There's no mention of this anywhere in Kelly. He never once uses the term personality trait, if I, if I remember correctly. He doesn't talk about motives. He doesn't talk about drives. He doesn't talk about sex. He doesn't talk about aggression. He doesn't talk about neuroticism, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness to experience, the big five. He doesn't talk about learning, which is the other big thing that was going on in psychology at the time. Skinner's uh, behaviorist uh, theories of learning, uh, contingencies of reinforcement, schedules of reinforcement, all of this is missing from Kelly's, uh, 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 from, the, from Kelly's theory. He's really starting from first principles and then trying to elaborate um, uh, a, a, a consistent cognitive theory of personality. And if it doesn't connect up with anything else, Kelly would say, it's just too bad for them. I don't, I don't care. Yeah. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the fundamental postulate. And then what Kelly does is to work out this fundamental postulate and its implications in a series of corollaries, a theoretical structure that is not unlike what we saw when I uh, introduced you to the, uh, the social learning theory of Julian Roeder. Uh, this is no accident. Roeder and Kelly were colleagues at Ohio State. They didn't talk to each other much, as far as I can determine, but, uh, but they, did have, uh, uh, they did share a building. Um, and they were developing kind of competing theories of personality, all using this formal structure of postulates and corollaries and all of this kind of stuff. But whereas Roeder developed a cognitive social learning theory that really kept very close to the uh, traditions of learning theory that were familiar to him in psychology, uh, Kelly threw it all out and said, oh, we're going to start from scratch here. Uh, we're not going to base our theory on, uh, on anything else. Nobody really got what Kelly was up to at the time. And the reason for this is, again, check out the date, 1955. This is the heyday of Skinnerian functional behaviorism. Nobody was thinking about cognitive sci uh, 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 psychology. Uh, nobody was thinking about cognitive science. Nobody was thinking about cognition. All they were really thinking about was stimulus and response and behaviorist theories of, uh, of learning. Okay. The first corollary in Kelly's personal construct theory is what he calls the construction corollary. A person anticipates events by construing their replications. Again, this is weird language, right? He don't really doesn't have to write this way. Uh, but basically what he says is you anticipate events by categorizing them. And if you, once you've categorized an event, you kind of know what to expect. That's what he means by anticipating events by construing their replications. If you had another object in this category, here's what it would do. If you had another ob uh, event in this category, here's what its consequences uh, would be. So here we get the core term in Kelly's personal construct theory, which is the construct, which is his name for concept. Remember, he couldn't even bring himself to use a word like concept, right? He had to use something strange. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, he starts making distinctions between various kinds of constructs. First, the distinction between core constructs and peripheral constructs. Core, core constructs are central um, to the way a, per a, a person perceives and experiences the world. They apply to lots of different kinds of events. They apply to lots of different kinds of um, of objects. Peripheral constructs are, as their name implies, not so important. You use them from time to time, but they don't play a major role in your, uh, in your experience of, uh, of the world. Um, 
Then Kelly makes a distinction between verbal constructs and preverbal constructs. As you might suggest, verbal constructs are constructs you can verbalize. You can express in a word or two, uh, maybe, a short, uh, maybe a short phrase. But um, remember, concept, uh, the constructs are concepts. They're all, most concepts are labeled by words like bicycle or automobile or neurotic or extrovert or whatever. Um, and uh, so these const many constructs can be labeled verbally. Others are not easy to articulate. Um, this is as close as Kelly ever comes in his theory to the notion of an unconscious concept or an unconscious thought. And he doesn't really want to talk about consciousness or, uh, or, or unconscious mental life. But he argues that some constructs are represented verbally in terms of verbal labels. Others are not. These are easier to talk about than these precisely because these are preverbal. They're not easy to articulate in words. As I say, it's not exactly the same thing as, as something unconscious. You might be conscious of, your, of having this construct but not be able to kind of articulate it to somebody else. Um, but that's as close as, um, as he comes. Okay, the construction corollator. A person anticipates events by figuring out what construct applies to them. Or, more properly, a person anticipates events by applying some construct to them. And we're going to see a little bit later on that you can choose what construct you're going to apply to some particular event. The individuality corollary. Persons differ from each other in their constructions of events. Everybody carries around in his, in his or her head a different set of personal constructs. That's why they're called personal constructs. We don't all have the same ones. Even those of us who grow up in the same culture, uh, have the same religious faith, have gone to the same schools, have the, roughly the same socioeconomic status. Even if you grow up in the same household with somebody else, you're not necessarily going to have the same set of personal constructs, okay? But the constructs you have are yours, okay? And they're going to determine how you anticipate events, how you perceive the world, and how you anticipate events is going to determine how you behave with respect um, to, uh, to those events. So, okay, that's the, uh, that's the individuality corollary. That's basically all he has to say about that. And again, he wants, just wants to make it clear that you don't have, you might have constructs because you're an American or because you're a Lutheran or because you're female or whatever, but even if you're, even all Lutheran American females are going to have their own sets of personal constructs. And that's the key to individual differences in personality, the key to human uniqueness. The organization corollary. Each person characteristically evolves for, its con for his convenience in anticipating events, a construction system embracing ordinal relations between constructs. All he had to say was constructs are arranged hierarchically into superordinate concepts and, sub, and, and subordinate concepts. But no, Kelly couldn't possibly do that. Um, but uh, that's, uh, that, that's basically what he means. That within your personal construct system, there are some very broad, very abstract, very highly generalized constructs. And then embedded underneath them, arranged in a hierarchical fashion, just like, you know, usual kind of um, uh, a, a concept, are more narrowly defined, more narrowly focused uh, kinds of concepts. Yes? Did you actually use the word hierarchical for uh, Yeah, he did. He Just not in the corollary itself. Uh, it's my, my memory, I actually have, I spent an entire summer reading this book. Um, uh, it's, uh, yeah. No, no. This corollary is about hierarchy. It's about vertical arrangement, ordinal relations among concepts. Some concepts are bigger, other concepts are littler. Some concepts come first, other concepts come later. So, no, he doesn't have a sense here in, of, of that kind of system. Okay, uh, so you got some, you got the, uh, the superordinate concepts, which are very broad, and by virtue of being superordinate, have a lot of implications. Okay, they carry a lot of information. If you construe an event in terms of a higher order superordinate concept, 
that, uh, that very abstract concept provides a lot of information about the, uh, about the thing. If you've got a subordinate concept, it provides a much narrower range of concepts, uh, a much narrower range of, of information. Think about a standard hier conceptual hierarchy. If I tell you something's a vehicle, you can predict that you know, it moves and it moves things and you can use it for transporting stuff and it's probably got wheels, though they don't always have wheels. If I tell you something's a Buick, it's got all those features, but then it's, you know, it's big and your grandfather owned one and stuff like that. Uh, so there's just kind of different kinds of information at different uh, levels of, um, of construction. The organization corollary. The dichotomy corollary. A person's construction system is composed of a finite number of dichotomous constructs. In the organization corollary, we're interested in the vertical relations between constructs, subordinate and superordinate. In the uh, dichotomy corollary, we're talking about uh, the horizontal relations among constructs. Uh, basically, Kelly is saying here that every construct has attached to it an opposite. Okay. So our constructs are really not categories so much as they are categories and, um, and, uh, and their opposites. The pole of the dichotomous construct that we tend to use in perceiving the world is what he would call the emergent construct. Its opposite is what he would call a contrasting construct. Now, you might think that, oh, this is pretty simple. This is like warm, cold, good, bad, male, female. Yes, it could be like that. But Kelly was very clear that for the individual, for any particular individual, the emergent, the, the contrast between the emergent construct and the contrasting construct might not be what you might think it is. So you could imagine somebody who has a construct of male, and you might think, well, the, 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 the uh, a contrast is female, but no, it might be good. Okay, so the world is divided into those that are male and those that are good, and um, that's just kind of the way that person thinks. It's the way the individual organizes the construct. You can't get these dichotomies by looking them up in a dictionary. They're personal constructs. It's a personal organization of experience. Sometimes people have difficulty thinking about what the contrast is. Again, this is where Kelly starts talking about thinking about things that are pre-verbal or maybe kind of sort of unconscious, he would call those submerged contrasts, okay? The submerged, you can't see them, okay? You've got to work hard to kind of dig out exactly what the contrast is. But the important thing here is that if all you know is what the emergent construct is, you only know half the story. You've got to know what the contrast is as well. It makes a big difference. If a person divides the world into male or female, or good or bad, and another person divides the world into male and bad, right? Or female and good, or female and bad, or whatever it is, that's a different organization, and that person is going to behave quite differently um, uh, in, uh, in the world. The choice corollary. Yes? Um, what, what, what he's really talking about is the finite number of constructs, okay? So that the constructs themselves have come in a finite number. You don't have thousands of them, okay? But the, con the, the finite number of constructs you have are themselves dichotomous, okay? So a dichotomous construct can have only two poles. That's what dichotomous means, okay? Um, and he's saying, well, People have probably more than one, but they don't have hundreds or thousands of these things. Um, it's a relatively reasonable number. He didn't know about it. This is 1955. But you might think of something like George Miller's magical number seven plus or minus two. You might think, yeah, most people have you know, somewhere between five and nine constructs that kind of really rattle around in their heads and organize their view of the world. Could be 15 or 17 could be 25 or 27, but it's some relatively small number, okay? And we'll see how you figure out what these constructs are in a couple of minutes. It's a very interesting procedure that Kelly invented. Okay, that's the dichotomy, choice corollary, okay? 
person chooses for himself that alternative in a dichotomized construct through which he anticipates the greater possibility of extension and definition of the system, okay? In other words, you've got these personal constructs, let's keep it simple, warm, cold, good, bad, smart, stupid, okay? But what you do is you choose for yourself which pole of each of those contrasts really works for you. So somebody might go around, and, uh, 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 go around the world thinking, oh, most people are pretty good, so good is the construct of choice and, you know, it, 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 out, out of the good-bad dichotomy. Another person who's a little bit more pessimistic, maybe a little bit more paranoid, might say, most people are bad, so what the, the bad filter is going to go up, okay? The, 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 the default assumption is going to be that most people are, uh, are not very nice um, not very nice people, okay? Um, now, you choose for yourself that alternative in a dichotomized construct system that really works for you, that helps you to anticipate events, that is most useful in predicting what's going to happen next or what features some, uh, some object is going to have. But it stands to reason that the more of these you have, the more possibilities you have for viewing the world. So Kelly starts talking about uh, a, a, uh, uh, the individual differences, not just in the contents of somebody's personal construct system, but also individual differences in the complexity or the structure of the, pers of, of, of the person's con uh, a personal construct system. You can imagine a person who goes around in the world who has a very monolithic personal construct system that consists of just one dichotomous construct good, bad, or male, female, or warm, cold, or smart, stupid, or whatever it, uh, it might be. A person who has a personal construct system that is that monolithic really has only one or two ways of viewing the world. You can see the world as good, you can see objects and events as good, or you can see them as bad, but you can't see them as anything else, because that's all you got. The more personal constructs you have in your system, the more different ways you have of construing the replications, the more different ways you have of viewing, um, uh, of viewing the world. Or put another way, the more opportunities you have for constructive alternativism, the more opportunities you have to say, oh, I'm not going to apply this construct to the world today or this particular object or whatever, I'm going to choose this one um, instead. The more options you have cognitively, then the more flexible your behavior. But if all you do is see the world in kind of Manichaean terms, black, white, good, bad, liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat, male, female, or whatever, if that's all you got, then you're very limited, not just in your cognitive repertoire, but you're very limited in your behavioral repertoire as well. Why? Because it's your cognitive repertoire, it's your repertoire of personal constructs that gives you the opportunity uh, that, that directs your behavior uh, to, uh, to begin with. Choice corollary. Then there's the range um, a corollary. Um, a construct is convenient for the anticipation of a finite range of events only. Okay. What Kelly's talking about here is that under ordinary circumstances, not every construct is going to apply to every object or event you encounter in the world. There's going to be a limited range of objects that can be construed through a kind of particular construct. Okay? And again, um, so first place, these constructs have rev relatively wide or relatively narrow range of convenience. They apply to lots and lots of different objects, or they apply to only a few um, objects. Um, and again, it kind of follows that superordinate constructs, very abstract constructs, will apply to lots of different events and objects. Subordinate constructs are going to apply to a relatively um, uh, small range of events. To go back to my automobile example for a moment, if I say, if I construe something as a vehicle or a not vehicle, I can have rocket ships and bicycles uh, 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 can, can have that construct applied to them. 
if I construe something as a Buick or a not a Buick, only a very small range of cars can be, uh, only a very small range of vehicles can, uh, can be construed with that kind of construct. So range of convenience is really, uh, is really very important. Again, think about a person with a very monolithic personal construct system. Somebody who views the world solely in terms of good, bad, smart, stupid, male, female, or something like that. At every event you encounter, you gotta fit into that personal construct system. I look at a chair, you know, and I gotta say, is that a male chair or a female chair? You know? And it just doesn't work for me, right? Uh, so what I need to do is to, is to have uh, uh, other kinds of constructs with maybe wider range of convenience that can be applied to other kinds of things. Um, a comfortable looking chair versus uncomfortable looking chair or something I like versus something I don't like, whatever uh, it is. If you try to fit all of the objects and events you experience into a relatively small set of constructs, you're going to find yourself in the position of Procrustes. You remember Procrustes, the mythical innkeeper who had only one size of bed? And if a guest came in and was too short, he stretched him out so he would fit in the bed. And if a guest came in who was too, call, too tall, he'd cut off body parts until the person fit. Watch out, if you ever go, stop in a hotel and the innkeeper's name Procrustes, walk away. Um, but that's what happens when you've only got a small set of personal constructs that you try to apply to the world. Paranoids have a small set of personal constructs that they apply to everything that, had the, that, that they encounter in the world. You know? uh, and I, we're talking about paranoids of the right, paranoids of the left, it doesn't matter. Uh, they all have the same kind of uh, the, the quality to their thought which is that there's a very small set of personal constructs that they apply to everything. A very small, very uh, the, uh, the, a finite set of, uh, of, of concepts that they use as a filter on all of their experience. The experience corollary. Here's as close as, um, as uh, Kelly ever gets to talking about learning so it would never occur to him to use the word learning, uh, not to mention things like reinforcement or something like that. A person's construction system varies as he successively construes the replications of events. Okay? So what happens is there's this event and you categorize it. You apply some construct to it that provides information about what you can expect to happen next. There's a hypothesis. And then if it happens, if what you predict is going to happen actually happens, you say, oh, that was the right construct, okay? But if, the, if your construct uh, doesn't make the right prediction, if you're surprised by what happens next or by what you find uh, next, then what you've got to do is you've got to refine your personal construct system. You've either got to change the implications of the construct or you've got to elaborate a new construct and add it uh, and add it to your system, okay? So you refine your personal construct system through experience, okay? Um, and you do that sometimes by adding constructs. Oh, I gotta think about things in a new way now. Add the construct. Or perhaps you find that a, way, a construct that you used to find convenient doesn't work for you anymore, okay? Uh, when you were in high school and you were the smartest kid in the class, that worked out all, 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 all right to describe the, to divide your classmates into the smart ones and the stupid ones or something like that. You get to a place like Berkeley where everybody's just as smart as you are, that doesn't work anymore. You've got to figure out some new way to organize um, your, uh, your, your acquaintances. Or maybe you refine definitions. Say, so, okay, um, I, I guess that's re not re really what I meant by um, uh, by good or bad or whatever the construct is. You kind of figure out uh, a little bit more what you mean. Or you might expand the range of convenience of a, of a construct. You might say, oh, gee, I never thought of it. But this construct applies to this kind of event too. Or you narrow the range of convenience. You say, gee, I used to think this construct applied to everything. Now I understand it only applies to a relatively small uh, range of, of objects. In one way or another, by virtue of your actual experience in the world, which is how you got your personal construct system to begin with, you are continually refining that personal construct system as you make, generate hypotheses, 
about um, uh, expectations and see whether those expectations are fulfilled or, um, or not. The modulation corollary. Here we get Kelly at his kind of linguistic best. The variation in a person's construction system is limited by the permeability of the constructs within whose ranges of convenience the variance lie. An almost unintelligible sentence. Okay. Um, but what he means here is that there are some constructs that, can, that are easy to change as a result of experience. There are other constructs that are more difficult to change as a result of experience permeability of constructs, their susceptibility to change. If you've read your Piaget, what Kelly's talking about here is something like the dynamic between assimilation and accommodation. You uh, 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 assimilate an, a, a stimulus to a pre-existing schema, and you accommodate your, uh, your uh, the schema, your cognitive schema, to, uh, the, to the new stimulus object. That's what permeability is really about. Some constructs are so useful, they're hard to change. Other constructs, they're easy to change. Core constructs, not so permeable. They're core because you use them a lot, and you use them just that way a lot. Peripheral constructs, probably more uh, 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 permeable. Superordinate constructs, not so permeable. Hard to change. They're very abstract. Subordinate constructs, easier. Uh, to change as a result of experience. So uh, you're modulating your personal construct system. Your, uh, uh, some, uh, some parts of your construct system are more um, amenable to this than others are. And then finally, now finally, we get the fragmentation corollary. A person may successfully, successively employ a variety of construction subsystems which are inferentially incompatible uh, with each other. Ordinarily, we would expect a person's personal construct system to be internally consistent. That is, the various constructs that he or she employs to anticipate events would uh, fit with each other, would articulate with each other in, uh, in various ways. That's what we mean, uh, that's what we mean by uh, the, the coherence. Um, and for example, in terms of the, uh, the uh, hierarchical arrangement of constructs, we would expect um, subordinate constructs to fit nicely um, uh, underneath, to be nested nicely underneath superordinate constructs. Think about, uh, Fisk and Taylor talked about this, I didn't, but Heider's balance theory or Festinger's cognitive dissonance theory. We expect our attitudes to be in balance. If John likes Judy and Judy likes Steve, then we expect John to like Steve. We expect things to be in balance. Okay? Festinger's cognitive dissonance theory. If I say I like a task and I say somebody else and I tell somebody else the task is bad, that behavior is uh, uh, conflicts with my attitude, creates dissonance that has to be resolved somehow. It wouldn't have occurred to Kelly to talk about Heider's balance theory, which he might have known about, or uh, Festinger's cognitive dissonance theory. But that's the general idea here, that we expect, these, we, we expect our personal construct systems to hang together. But they don't always. Okay? If somebody has an idiosyncratic personal construct system in which one pole is female and the other pole is bad, Okay, those the, 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 that personal construct system is not going to uh, is going to be highly fragmented. It, the, things are not going to fit together uh, very well. So that's what we uh, that's what we would expect. And Kelly argued, for example, that maybe in schizophrenia, what we have is a very fragmented personal construct system by virtue of the thought disorder in schizophrenia. Uh, the thoughts that people have, the, the th thoughts that, that, that schizophrenics have. Uh, don't necessarily make sense, don't necessarily fit with each other, uh, but in normal mental life, we would expect some degree of, um, of coherence. And the commonality corollary. To the extent that one person employs a construction of experience which is similar to that employed by another, his psychological processes will be similar to that other person. Birds of a feather flock together. If people perceive an event the same way, 
they're going to respond to that event the same way. Every act of perception is an act of categorization. If people construe an event the same way, they're going to behave uh, uh, in response to that event um, the same way. So personal constructs are the key to individual differences in personality, but we are not just different from each other, we're also alike, uh, we're also like each other uh, in various respects, but what the, the dimensions that, that, that make for difference and similarity are not difference, uh, trait dimensions of personality, but rather cognitive dimensions of personality. So if, you, uh, if two people construe an event the same way, they're going to behave the same way uh, in response to, uh, to that event. Familiar example, the study date. Call up your boyfriend or your girlfriend. You say, hey, let's go on a study date. You know? I don't even know whether you people do these kinds of things anymore. But back in the medieval period, uh, people used to do that. And of, of course, one person wanted to study <laughs> and one person wanted to date, right? Uh, so they had two different constructions of, the t of, 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 of what, what, what's entailed in a study date, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and, and those constructions would come into conflict. But if they had the same understanding of, what, uh, of what, what's entailed by a study date, then things would go all, go all, uh, all right, because each would have accurate expectations about what the other one uh, was, um, was expecting. Okay, so people are similar and different from each other in terms of their cognitions, in terms of their personal construct systems, okay? Uh, uh, in terms of um, what constructs they have, what poles of constructs they choose to emphasize, uh, what the contrasts are in their constructs, and so on and so forth. The more similarity cognitively between two people, the more, uh, the, the, the more similarly we can expect them uh, to behave. And then the sociality corollary. To the extent that one person construes the construction processes of another, he may play a role in a social process involving the other person. Here's the old uh, 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 the adage, you don't understand another person unless you've walked a mile in his or her shoes. Okay? Um, uh, Elvis Presley song, if I remember correctly. Uh, but it goes back even longer uh, than that. The idea that Kelly has here is you can't have a relationship with another person unless you understand how that person construes events. You can't have a relationship with another person unless you have some idea how they think what their personal construction system is and how they deploy that personal construct system, what, uh, what um, uh, pull of a construct they choose to apply, what the range of convenience is, and all that other kind of stuff. To the extent that you know that about another person, you can have a relationship with that person. You can play a role in a social process involving that person. But if you don't understand how the other person views the world, there's no basis for a relationship. Okay? Um, you, you, you literally cannot get along because you don't understand how the other person thinks. Now, Kelly does not mean to suggest here that you can't have a relationship unless you think like the other person. You can you can't have a relationship unless you know how the other person thinks. There's a difference between those kinds of things. You can be yourself with your own personal construct system, but you also need to appreciate how the other person thinks. That's what intersubjectivity is all about. That's what social cognition is all about. Being able to understand what the other person is thinking and feeling and desiring, not just looking at what he or she is doing, okay? But since all of that emanates from or is determined by his or her personal construct system, what you have to do is understand what that, uh, what that is. And if you do understand what, a person's personal con what another person's personal construct system is, then you can effectively predict how he or she is going to respond. Okay? You do something, you turn to your roommate and you say, my parents are going to kill me. Okay? The reason you say something like that is because you know how your parents are going to think. You have some sense of how they're going to construe this same, uh, this same event. Of course, they hardly ever do kill you. But the fact that you say things like that uh, uh, 
uh, is, is just a, a, a manifestation of how you're getting inside somebody else's head and viewing the person, uh, the, viewing the world the way they do. Okay, so how do you figure out what a person's personal constructs are? Kelly was a clinical psychologist. He spent his entire career doing psychotherapy and doing assessments. It was pretty weird, apparently, being a, um, uh, uh, a, 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 a therapy client of, uh, of Kelly's because he wasn't like anybody else's psychotherapist. Other people would go to psychotherapists like, you know, some Freudian therapist, and they'd lie on a couch, and they'd talk about their dreams, and they'd free associate uh, various kinds of things. And other people would go to Carl Rogers-type therapists. Rogers was at Ohio State at the same time. Just imagine what this place was like, okay? Carl Rogers, Julian Roeder, uh, uh, George Kelly. It must have been unbelievable. And uh, Rogers would have people sit up and say, well, what do you want to talk about today? And the person would say, well, I'd like to take an ax to my mother. And he'd say, oh, that's very interesting that you'd like to take an ax to your mother and just kind of go on like that. And then People would go to Kelly, they'd get assigned to Kelly for therapy, and there'd be this guy speaking this Martian language about personal construct systems and all this kind of stuff. But Kelly invented a technique that he used to try to tap into people's personal construct systems, a technique that he called the Rule Construct Repertory Test, because it was intended to assess, to reveal the repertoire of personal constructs that an individual, uh, an individual uh, held. And the role construct repertory test basically went in three phases, and you can do this for yourself. Uh, if you look on the lecture supplements for, um, uh, 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 for uh, social learning, you'll see a, a whole list of the roles. This is a, comes from a shorter version of the, uh, what's known as the rep test, because people can't say role construct repertory test too, uh, too well. The rep test, this is a short version uh, devised by Frank Beery, um, where there are roles, very abstract social roles. Yourself, a person you dislike, your mother, your father, a person you'd like to help, a friend of the same sex or of the opposite, and of the opposite sex. You've got to uh, do one of each of these. A person with whom you'd feel uncomfortable, your boss, uh, and a person you find difficult to understand. And the first task for the, for the person is to instantiate each of these roles, to actually name a person in their lives who fills each one of these roles. Well, yourself is easy, okay? And then think of somebody you dislike, okay? Uh, your mother, or the person who played the role of mother in your life, your spouse, uh, or the person who plays that role in your life. They're kind of broad, uh, broadly uh, determined. So that's the first thing you do. You'd actually instantiate each of these with the name of some specific person that you know. It can't be Mahatma Gandhi. It can't be Judas Maccabeus. It's got to be somebody in your actual life. Okay? Then what Kelly would do is he'd go through the list and he'd, uh, he'd uh, uh, pick out triads of roles like a person you dislike, your father, and a friend of the opposite sex. And he'd ask people to identify some way in which two of these people are alike and different from the third. Okay? And then just to write down what that way is. Male, female, warm, cold, smart, stupid, whatever, um, a, a good, bad, or whatever. And then you just kind of repeat that. Now, there were something like 25 different roles in the original version of the rep test. And if you're doing your permutations and combinations, that's a lot. Uh, 25 objects selected three at a time uh, is, is, a lot of, uh, is a lot of combinations. So he just kind of do this for a while until he thought he had sampled the whole thing. And then what he'd do is he'd actually go back and have uh, his, his clients rate each one of the people specified in each of these roles on each of the constructs. What Kelly tried to do there was to get a sense of what constructs the person applied, how is two people alike and different from the third, that's similarity, that's categorization, and also to try to figure out how varied, 
how rich, um, how many different constructs the person had. Okay, doing nowadays we do this statistically with factor analysis, but basically trying to get at what he called cognitive complexity or the structure of things. So it was by virtue of this kind of procedure that Kelly tried to figure out what a person's personal constructs were, what categories the person used to, uh, to uh, perceive the world and to um, generate hypotheses about what was going to happen. Individual differences in behavior are caused by individual differences in cognition. Individual differences in cognition are most easily represented by individual differences in categorization. It's those individual differences in categorization that lay at the heart of Kelly's thoroughly cognitive personal construct theory of personality. Okay, we'll take this same theme in a somewhat different direction on Monday when we talk about social construction. Thank you very much. Sorry to keep you a little late.